I V M. Pakistan is sitting on mounds and mounds of debt. Since 1958, Pakistan has taken 21 loans from the IMF, and this is going to be their 13th bailout. In November, the Pakistani Minister of Finance, Asad Umar, said that the country's financing gap stood at 12 billion dollars. Why is Pakistan's economy reeling under so much debt? Will loans from China make it worse? Will the IMF give it a good deal, or will Pakistan have to default on its loans? Welcome to States of Anarchy, a weekly podcast on global affairs, international relations, and foreign policy. I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan. Every single day, we hear some news about Pakistan. In fact, no conversation about India's foreign policy is ever complete without us speaking about Pakistan. So today, I'm joining the bandwagon, but hopefully without all the screaming and calling for nuclear annihilation. My guest for today is Michael Kugelman. He's the Asia Program Deputy Director and researches on South Asia at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington DC. Before we go into the interview, let's take a short break. Hello everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM podcast. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We are IVM podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So just wanted to make a note for everybody. We do have this new Alexa skill that we've created for Cyrus Says. If you have an Alexa, please say play Cyrus Says and you should be able to listen to the podcast on the Alexa from now on. Speaking of Cyrus Says, this week Cyrus is joined by Dr. Vishaka Shiv Dasani. They talk about healthy eating and nutrition and Vishaka clears Cyrus's confusion about the professions of nutritionists, dietitian, doctors and health coaches. This week on Geek Fruit, Tejas and Dinka bring on producer Zoya to discuss Interstellar and the Dark Knight trilogy, and rank the on-screen portrayals of Batman. On the Sponge Podcast, Ambi Parmeshwar and talks about what makes for a great client and agency relationship, and how not to get caught in intra-company crossfires. On MF101, Anupam talks to Manish Dangi, co-CIO of Debt at Aditya Birla Sun Life Mutual Fund about debt mutual funds, its characteristics, and current scenarios. We have launched a brand new sports show called What a Player. Where the hosts give you insights about the latest games, scores, and strategies. Do check it out for updates about the ongoing T20 cricket league. New episodes are out every morning. This week on Dating is Garbage, our hosts invite the first couple on the show, Navin Narona and Abhishek Tundel, to talk about the green flags of dating. On Crocs Tales, Anand Sivakumar narrates tales of friendship, dating, and love, all centered around the phrase "kuch meetha ho jaye." This week on our Kannada podcast, Thale Arate, CV Madhukar discusses how philanthropy and impact investing can make a difference in our society. And with that, let's get on with your show. Welcome back to States of Anarchy. I'm with Michael Kugelman. Michael, welcome to the show. India and Pakistan got independence at the same point in time, but 70 years down, both the economies look very different. Could you briefly walk me through how far Pakistan's economy has come since 1947? Yeah, it's a fair question, and it's great to be here with you. It's a fair question because uh, early in their histories, uh, India and Pakistan uh, had relatively similar economic performances in terms of. Macroeconomic uh, indices, but certainly things change, and things change quite quickly. Uh, you know, several factors, several ways of answering the question. One is that uh, um, Pakistan was just consumed by all types of internal instability uh, very quickly, and that continued for quite some time. And that obviously has made it difficult for it to grow as a, its economy in a big way. But I would also argue that the, um, the military has always had an outsized role. In politics and the state in Pakistan, unlike in India, and traditionally the army um, and the broader military in Pakistan has tended to hog hog a lot of uh, defense, budgetary mm-hmm. spending. So that's made it more difficult to allocate spending to healthcare and education and those types of important areas that contribute to economic development. But then I think there were also some some poor policy decisions made by Pakistani um, economic policymakers. Go back to the the sixties, uh, in particular the fifties, the sixties. You know, the the world was starting to recognize that it was time to move away from manufacturing only. Yeah. Uh, and I think that you know you had a lot of these countries that became the Asian tigers mm-hmm. that recognized the the importance of the services sector. Started to get into that, whereas Pakistan was very stubborn. And it maintained a focus on textiles. Textiles became, you know, have been for a very long time the main uh, export product mm-hmm. out of Pakistan. It's still like that today. And so, you know, at a time in previous decades when you know India and Bangladesh and other countries were starting to look 
beyond manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Pakistan stayed fixated on manufacturing to the point that today, you know, even the most recent economic crisis, the current economic crisis that Pakistan is facing, uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be attributed to many things, but one of them is just really poor export performance simply mm -hmm. because you have these low value added textile exports that can't compete with China's and Bangladesh's and India's and it's put Pakistan in a bad position where it really mm -hmm. cannot compete and that's that's had an impact on its on its balance of payment situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is true that uh, for many years Pakistan has depended on outside um, sources for for financing, uh, certainly military assistance, but also economic assistance. And uh, you know, you look at the variety of countries that can, have contributed to that in different ways. So the you know, the obvious ones that come to mind first are the United States, China, Saudi Arabia, um, but there have been others. Uh, as well, and I think that many economists in Pakistan have long recognized that uh, you know it's not necessarily the most sustainable economic strategy to mm -hmm. be so dependent on foreign uh, financing, foreign aid for so long. Um, but I think that you know one, one of the issues here is that some of the countries that have been fairly generous in providing economic support, such as the United States, think that providing that support confers some type of leverage um, mm -hmm. for these donor states and. In the case of the United States, a belief that by providing economic support to Pakistan you know, several decades ago, Pakistan would have um, you know, reined in this whole nuclear weapons developed thing. Obviously, that didn't work out that way. And then more recently, there's been a view in the part of many in Washington that economic support can help um, Pakistan or can make Pakistan want to alter its behavior toward terrorists in a, in a way that would help serve U.S. interests. It's a wrong-headed view, in my view. <laughs> Even with the war in Afghanistan, there was, uh, because Pakistan was the main launch pad of um, the U.S.'s uh, war in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, that was also an, a reason why the U.S. increased its aid to Pakistan, right? Um, something else that I was wondering about was Pakistan's loans with the IMF. Um, recently, these have come up because... Um, the new uh, Prime Minister, Imran Khan, has been going to Saudi Arabia. He was recently in China. How good or bad is the Pakistan economy in repaying some of these loans? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, one of the biggest um, manifestations of Pakistan's current economic crisis is its indebtedness. It's mm -hmm. heavily in debt. Um, and whereas, you know, there's sort of a reflexive, a suggestion that oh it's all because of these loans coming in from China that's mm -hmm. that's the big problem that's why Pakistan is so indebted certainly all these loans coming in from China are putting Pakistan in debt but a lot of those loans um, aren't going to have to be repaid for another decade or so so it's not like Pakistan is, is has that immediate need to pay those loans back you have to look at other areas such as for example public companies mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a number of uh, public corporations in India, such as, um, pardon me, in Pakistan, such as mm -hmm. its airline, Pakistan International Airways, Pakistan Railroads, um, you know, this uh, Steel Mills Corporation, several very infamous public companies that have just been struggling um, for many years. Uh, they're heavily, heavily in debt. And you look at the figures that the Pakistani government itself puts out, uh, you know, the debt of some of these public companies has skyrocketed by more than 100, even 200 percent over the last few years. So this is where the big problem is. And so, yes, Pakistan is having a huge problem paying back its debt. And this is one reason why, you know, it's decided to go back to the IMF um, for the umpteenth time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's, it's never particularly popular politically for Pakistani leaders to go to the IMF. Mm -hmm. That's particularly the case now uh, under the government of Imran Khan, simply because this is a government that has projected a particularly strident anti-West position. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the Prime Minister, Imran Khan, who uh, you know, the day after the election, July, the end of July, which, he, which his party won, he made a speech to the nation in which he said, we are going to become an Islamic welfare, our economy is going to become an Islamic welfare system. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, and if the idea is to move toward that, mm -hmm. whatever that means, and we can discuss <laughs> what that means, the optics of going to the IMF for a lot of the optics of going to a preeminent Western financial institution, mm. beggarable in hand, optics are suboptimal, to say the least. But yeah, I think Pakistan recognizes that in an ideal world, it would not go to the IMF. It would mm. try to simply depend on the largesse of its, of its main supporters, which these days are not the United States, but Saudi Arabia, where of course it got a $6 billion aid package, 
and China, where it's, it's, it's hoping to get some money. But I think Pakistan understands that even if it gets um, uh, aid packages from its best friends, it's, it's not going to be enough, given mm-hmm. its, its extent of indebtedness, given the severity of its balance of payments crisis, that it is going to have to go to the IMF and ask for something. Even if it's not the 10 to $12 billion originally envisioned, it'll still have to ask for something. All right. So before you explain to me what an Islamic welfare system is, uh, <laughs> how many times before has Pakistan gone to the IMF? I'm not looking for a particular number. Just uh, have there been many instances? Were those loans also for public companies? Um, what was the trend before this time? Yeah, well, it's, it's a case of, of uh, deja vu all over again, to, uh, to, to, to be very candid. Pakistan has gone back to the IMF many times, uh, you know, well, more than 10 times, uh, probably a, a dozen. Um, and it's really the same thing playing out. I mean, Pakistan suffers from this, the same balance of payments crises every few years. Indebtedness goes up every few years. Uh, it's all because of, of, of these bad economic policy decisions, like not having good, well-performing exports. So, you know, it goes to the IMF, it asks for a loan, it asks for varying amounts each time. And typically the IMF will expect that Pakistan will indeed address the problems of its public companies. Uh, uh, another big ask that the IMF typically makes of Pakistan, particularly with the most recent uh, loan packages, is to rein in the debt within its energy sector. Pakistan mm-hmm. has major power shortages, and part of the problem is that the uh, Energy companies don't have enough money to provide energy because people don't pay their energy bills. So this has been a big focus of the IMF as well. Okay. And that's basically what we're going to see this time. I, mean, I think the big question this time is whether the IMF chooses to sort of bring in the CPEC issue in this and mm-hmm. try to insist that it be able to take a good hard look at these uh, these loans that undergird the, uh, the CPEC financing. But basically, it's it's the same story each time. And oftentimes, Pakistan doesn't necessarily do what the IMF expects it to do, but uh, it still gets the money. Okay. Before we go to CPEC, what is Islamic financing? Yeah, I was afraid you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> I, mean, I think the idea here is to move away from the type of aid dependency that Pakistan has had for, for much of its history. And I think that the, and this is, I think, a very well-intentioned idea. Mm-hmm. I think the idea is to move away from having to, uh, to, to look to handouts from the likes of the United States or even the Chinese or, or, or other bilateral partners and try to move into a more self-sustaining, self-sufficient system in which you can look at uh, Islamic charities, things like that in Pakistan, mm-hmm. which already do a very good job of raising mm-hmm. funds. And I, th- and I know that the Pakistani diaspora also plays a role in providing support to those charities, mm-hmm. including the, the Pakistani diaspora in the United States. So I think this is all very well-intentioned, uh, particularly because you already have some progress on the ground that these charities, these religious charities, um, taking in money and providing support to those that, that need it. Now, you know, this new government in Pakistan has made many ambitious promises and mm-hmm. vows, and it's unclear if it'll actually be able to, to follow through on them, because in a country like Pakistan, where it's just complicated, you've got a lot of entrenched interests, it's hard to, to take these big ideas and, and implement them. Um, yeah, I think another problem, that particularly those here and in Washington, and I imagine other places as well would be a bit concerned about is that some of these religious charities are perfectly legit. Um, but, you know, several of them are tied to terrorist organizations. And I think this is where you sort of run into some concerns on the part of U.S. policymakers here that, you know, if you decide to empower these Islamic charities, does that mean that you're going to provide more support or, or allow Islamic charities that are, for example, tied to Jamaat Udawa, Lashkari Taiba, these groups that are very familiar in, in India, Will they be empowered? Will they be supported? Um, and at this, this raises the question as to whether you could have some of these watchdog groups, like the Financial Action Task Force, which mm-hmm. monitor terrorist financing. Will this raise concerns for them? And could this cause sanctions and problems for Pakistan, which has already been grade listed yeah. by the Financial Action Task Force for not doing enough to deal with terrorist financing? Mm-hmm. And there's also, well, that is said, with financing, there's also a problem of um, financing extremists who could just be different, whether they're partaking in politics or whatever they're doing. Um, is this a change or pivot to an Islamic welfare system also indicative of the fact that uh, more Wahhabism could be coming into Pakistan? Well, it's a fair question. 
Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Again, I don't want to generalize too much. Uh, but certainly, I mean, you look at the streams of, of funding into Pakistan, and certainly, you know, you do have a number of funders in the Gulf, whether you're talking about Saudi Arabia or other Gulf countries that do funnel support that goes to these Wahhabi um, institutes and the like. So absolutely, I mean, if, if, you, if, if Pakistan really is serious about trying to uh, you know, empower these Islamic charities and create more of them. It certainly provides more opportunities mm-hmm. for the likes of these um, these retrograde, uh, hardline uh, Islamic schools of thought that have, uh, you know, in, in their worst case scenarios, caused problems and allowed uh, terrorist organizations to benefit. So that's, I think that's a that certainly is a concern. But again, I don't think we want to get ahead of ourselves. I wouldn't place too much stock in this vow that Imran Khan has made to create an Islamic welfare state. I think that we would, there's still a lot more immediate uh, concerns he needs to address, mm. such as this huge uh, crisis of indebtedness. True, despite the rhetoric, Pakistan has some structural issues that it fundamentally needs to address. We'll be back after a short break. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, the show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Pesa Vesa is brought to you by Paytm Money. And we're back after the break. Moving on to uh, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. There's been a lot of uh, wariness around the project presumably from the Indian side. But uh, what is CPEC? What does it envision to do? So CPEC, first off, of course, is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, it's a component of the broader Belt and Road Initiative, which, which you can, we can get into if you like. And so the idea is to um, build a lot of infrastructure in Pakistan. That's basically what it comes down to. It entails Chinese investments in new roads, um, railways, a new, uh, building up this port in Gwadar and Baluchistan in the southern, uh, southwest Pakistan, uh, building more power plants, putting more electricity on the grid. So the idea here, um, you know, there, there are several objectives that, that China has. One of them is basically to further its goal, its broader geostrategic goal of hastening access to far-flung markets in order to feed its rapidly growing economy. But of course, flip side of this, the other goal of China is to expand its global footprint and expand its global influence, particularly mm-hmm. as it continues, as its star continues to rise as a power, and a future superpower. So those are China's objectives. But I think that for Pakistan, um, you know, Islamabad sees benefits here. Mm-hmm. You know, the very, the very goals that um, CPEC is meant to serve are the very goals that Pakistan has, uh, and the, the, you know the, the things that China is trying to do are filling gaps in Pakistan's own economic development. So, for example, bad infrastructure has always been a really serious concern uh, in, in, in Pakistan. Its roads are in very poor condition. Uh, you hear all these stories about trucks trying to bring produce, fruit, fresh fruits, vegetables from one area to the other, and with the road problems, they get stuck, and then they, all the, the products go rotten. So, you know, it's an issue right there. Power generation is a big concern. I mean, Pakistan has suffered from a major energy crisis uh, over the last few years. So, what I'm saying here is that for Pakistan, if all this works out, there could be very significant benefits. Uh, and that it, its infrastructure could improve, its energy security could improve. And with that comes more prosperity and more stability, which is where outcomes that, that you know, no no reasonable actor, whether we're talking about India or the United States yeah. or anyone else, should should have any issue with that's true. I mean, it's great that Pakistan's uh, national economic interests are in line with what the project wants to do. But what are the major concerns that other countries have? What are concerns that people within Pakistan have? 
Sure, and yeah, of course, the, the, there are a lot of concerns. Uh, I think the major one is clearly a strategic concern uh, that, that evinces itself in New Delhi and also in the United States. This idea of China, uh, you know, both India and America's top strategic rival, really deepening its footprint in a in a country that is very worrisome to both India and the United States. I think that's the big concern. As as you know, even better than I. There have long been concerns that China is intentionally building out very methodically a <clears throat> deeper presence in South Asia uh, in order to, quote, encircle mm-hmm. India. Um, I won't comment on how accurate that, you know, that alarmist term is, but certainly to the extent that China has already been, been able to make significant inroads economically through its investments in places like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, Pakistan to be sure, and increasingly you know, smaller countries in South Asia where India has traditionally had a fair amount of influence and presence, like Nepal, Bhutan, you know, the entire Doklam uh, standoff last year, I think I see that as a case where China was trying to test India to see how India would respond if China tries to sort of push forward in areas where India has a lot of influence. So CPEC plays right into this existing concern in New Delhi that China is essentially trying to, you know, make life very difficult. For, for India. In terms of the United States, you know, it's similar. I mean, the United States has stated very formally that te- not it's not terrorism anymore, but strategic rivalry um, that constitutes its biggest national security concern. Mm-hmm. The U.S.'s national security strategy that it released almost a year ago, last December, mm-hmm. that's what exactly what it said. It said that strategic rivalry is our biggest national security concern. That means China. Because mm-hmm. China is America's top strategic rival. So for the U.S. to see China deepening its presence in a big way in a country that is very strategically significant for the United States, mm-hmm. yet also a country where the U.S. is very unpopular and much less present than China is, that certainly is concerning. So mm-hmm. I think that you know how you perceive CPEC depends on which lens you apply. And I think this applies for both India and the United States. If you apply... An economic lens, you think, well, this is great. You've got all these 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 ideas of or all these objectives of, you know, um, improving infrastructure and bringing more energy security, creating jobs. Mm-hmm. That's great. But if you apply the strategic lens, mm-hmm. you see that you know China is slowly but surely deepening its footprint uh, in an area that uh, is troublesome to both the United States and India. Now, in terms of Pakistan's own perceptions of CPEC, you know, officially the rhetoric is is very heady. It's, it's extremely positive mm-hmm. to the point that, you know, it's become one of these issues. CPEC has become one of these issues that if you journalist in Pakistan and you publish an article that tends to be pretty critical of CPEC, you know, you could be shouted down. Mm-hmm. Um, it shouldn't be like that, but it is. Um, so, you know, I, I think that many Pakistanis, particularly in, you know, the more urban settings in the East, in, in Islamabad and Lahore, they think it's, it's, it's the greatest thing since sliced mm-hmm. bread. Um, <laughs> but there is nuance in terms of public, um, perceptions of it. Certainly more vulnerable communities in Pakistan, uh, such as the, the Baluch, uh, and, you know, those that have seen time and again, the state, sometimes with foreign support, coming in and doing a lot of construction and development, exploiting resources and not basically not giving anything back yeah. to locals. These are the people that have been concerned. Mm. But increasingly, what we've seen over the last year or so is a recognition, even within the highest corridors of power, that mm. the financial risks of CPEC are significant. Mm. Um, that even though Pakistan doesn't need to pay back for most of these loans, at least for, for a number of years, you know, the debt continues to increase. Um, and it was telling that over the last year or so, there have been several products, projects, CPEC projects that Pakistan has declined to sign on to, um, including China had offered to pay for the construction of the Daimrabasha Dam, which mm. is this huge dam that Pakistan has been wanting to build for years, but it's never been able to get funding for it. Mm. But basically, it concluded that uh, China's financing terms for Daimrabasha were not favorable to Pakistan mm-hmm. and had walked away, which is a pretty big deal, given all the trouble of getting financing for this dam and given the extent of Pakistan's water mm-hmm. shortages. So what you're seeing now in Pakistan is increasing recognition that it may need to think about ways to perhaps restructure or renegotiate mm-hmm. some of these loans with India, pardon me, with China, to make 
the whole enterprise more financially viable for Pakistan. Um, and I think that the if, if Pakistan gets a loan from the IMF, I think the IMF will, you know, it will, it will need to look at all of these CPEC loans as they are now. That could give an, uh, create an opportunity mm. for Pakistan to try to talk to China about negotiating better arrangements that would mm. be more viable for Pakistan. Yeah, I remember uh, reading something about a digital CPEC, which is mm. Pakistan builds Wi-Fi and, uh, yeah, I think security cameras and lots of things. Yeah. Something that I also remember reading about earlier this year was a clash between some Chinese construction workers in Baluchistan, I think, who were drinking and something happened and then they clashed with some locals in the area. So, is there such a fear that if Pakistan is looking to look at something that is, if we can debate Islamic welfare, and China is a state that fundamentally doesn't have a religious backing of some kind. Um, what about cultural perceptions between the two countries? What do you think of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, Pakistan and China are very close. So I think China gets a lot of passes mm -hmm. from Pakistan. It's allowed to do things that Pakistan simply, would, or Pakistan and its people would simply not allow mm -hmm. for. So, you know, for instance, the idea of the United States, um, you know, opening up uh, restaurants and newspapers mm -hmm. and all these things in, in Pakistan, it wouldn't work. But but it's remarkable that as CPEC has developed, as the investments have increased, as you have more Chinese laborers coming into Pakistan to, not just laborers, laborers and managers mm -hmm. coming into Pakistan to sort of implement these projects, it certainly has, led, has some very interesting cultural uh, impacts that I think for many in Pakistan aren't a big deal because China is so popular, but mm -hmm. others, you know, are increasingly concerned. I mean, there, I think there is this this concern about um, how China is just casting a longer cultural shadow than it had before. I mean, the fact that in some some public schools in some parts of the country, Chinese has become a mandatory language for kids in oh. the fourth or fifth grade, um, and the fact that you've had so many um, Chinese media outlets, particularly Chinese language newspapers that have, that have opened up. And that, you know, with that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that in of itself, but, you know, you alluded to this example of, um, of tensions between Chinese nationals and, and locals in Baluchistan. You know, there have been some instances where you've had Chinese uh, actually using threatening violence against locals. Or there is a case, um, maybe this is what you were referring to, not too long ago, where some Chinese laborers basically rioted. They took yeah, these steps, yeah. And they rioted. Um, they jumped on top of uh, some Pakistani police cars. Mm. They were angry, as I understand it, because they weren't allowed to leave their, their barracks mm. to go out and have fun, so to speak. Uh, and so the optics of these Chinese laborers standing on top of Pakistani police cars holding these, these sticks, that I think is very troubling. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there are some in Pakistan that see this as some type of post-colonial mm -hmm. type thing where China is really engaging in something that goes beyond cultural engineering to mm -hmm. the point that you have to worry about, you know, cultural imperialism, all that stuff. I don't want to use too many big words. But I think that's an increasing concern that mm -hmm. we didn't hear about as much with CPEC a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And how does this fit into, apart from just South Asia, into China's vision of the Baton Road project? Mm -hmm. um, because CPEC was, I think, the first project that got funding from the Baton Road. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the linchpin of the Baton Road. So how does it fit into the larger Baton Road project? Yeah, it's important for several reasons. One is the geography of it. I mean, Pakistan, you look at a map, I mean, Pakistan plays a very significant role, really, as a, as a gateway um, to the uh, to the Middle East for China and also a gateway to, uh, to Central Asia to some extent. And, uh, you know, the fact that Pakistan has this very significant warm water port in Gwadar, mm. uh, this is all important for China. Um, and, you know, another reason why Pakistan is important, or CPEC is important for for the, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is just that China is actually dealing with a very friendly country. Mm -hmm. You know, it, again, it wouldn't be able to get away with so many of these things in other countries. Um, so I think that China sees Pakistan and CPEC not only as significant because of the, the geography of it, but also because of the politics of it, that it has a very trusted friend that, mm -hmm. in my view, needs Beijing more than Beijing needs Islamabad, mm -hmm. uh, to put it quite candidly. So, so there's that. And 
you know, it, it is important to see CPEC in the broader context of the Belt and Road Initiative because we, we always talk about how much money is involved mm-hmm. with CPEC. You know, the figure changes every week, but you're talking about, I think now, what, 50, 50 billion, 60 yeah, billion, yeah. something like that. Um, the, the entire Belt and Road Initiative, as I understand it, the amount of money that's envisioned to be put into that uh, exceeds uh, by a whole lot the total amount of the Marshall Plan was put into place after World War II by the United States. So it's, it's huge. And so as big as CPEC is, it's only a small part of a much bigger enterprise that China is trying to, uh, to put together. Um, I, you know, I think another reason why CPEC is important, but this is sort of important in a negative sense, is that I think it really represents the, it really crystallizes the risks for China of um, engaging in this huge project um, in India's neighborhood. Um, you know, as you probably know, India hasn't said all that much officially about its views about CPEC, but it has come out very formally uh, one time before this, this meeting mm-hmm. on the Belt and Road Initiative in Beijing. It yeah. came out very formally, said that it was not going to send a representative there, and then it basically laid out a sovereignty justification. Mm-hmm. It said that we cannot support these connectivity projects that violate sovereignty. And of course, the, the, what it was referring to is the fact that CPEC is envisioned to um, go through Gilgit Baltistan, which, as, as you know, is is, is uh, a region of Kashmir that's um, administered by Pakistan but claimed by India. So, to the extent that India has any type of formally expressed opposition to um, Belt and Road Initiative, it's CPEC. It's mm-hmm. not BRI on the whole. Mm-hmm. But again, the fact that China, that India has registered its unhappiness about what it describes as a territorial violation, sovereignty violation, that crystallizes the rivalry between India and Mm. China. And you don't really see that as much Mm. playing out in in other places. It's just Pakistan. Okay, I have one last question for you. For anyone who is interested in reading more about the Pakistani economy or the Belt and Road Project, is there a book or a recommended reading? that you would suggest? Well, I mean, I would argue that there, there's no shortage of great resources in mm. Pakistan on this issue. Uh, and I think in terms of the most current resources, particularly for those that have short attention spans, um, the coverage um, and the reportage and the analyses of Koram Hussein, who um, basically runs the business side of reporting at Dawn newspaper in Pakistan, is very good. Mm. Uh, and he's not afraid to be critical when he thinks there's a need to be. Uh, so I would certainly, I would certainly suggest that. Um, I would also uh, suggest the um, the works of uh, you know some of these top line Pakistani economists out there, including people like Ishrat Hussain, who mm-hmm. now is leading in a, a, um, a he's now as a senior advisor in the Imran Khan government mm-hmm. on issues like austerity, institutional reform. He's come out with a book relatively recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You know, I think that's a good place to start. If you want broader context, Andrew Small's uh, book on the China-Pakistan relationship is probably one of the better books on South Asian geopolitics in recent mm-hmm. years. And you know, he gets into these economic issues and these CPEC issues as well. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you for your time and for talking to us. <laughs> Thank you. It was my pleasure. That's it for this episode of States of Anarchy. Thanks for staying with us. If you're interested more about debt in Pakistan, then I've attached a bunch of readings for you in the description of this podcast. So if you have any comments or questions, just reach out to me on Twitter where I'm at the rate Hamsani H or on Instagram at the rate States of Anarchy. You can listen to States of Anarchy on the IVM podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcast from. I'll be back next Tuesday. The most engaging and the most useful conversations you may have in your life are likely to be with your most challenging customers. Hi, I'm Ambi Parmeshwaran and on this podcast, I will take you through my book, Sponge, Leadership Lessons I Learned from My Clients. Packed with real stories about real people, but most of all, packed with the innumerable lessons I soaked up from some of the most iconic business leaders like Ratan Tata, Azim Premji, S. Ramadurai, Karsan by Patel, M. Damodaran, Dr. Kurian, and many more. Don't forget to tune into the Sponge Podcast. Keep sponging to keep learning. Hey. 
Hey, this is Shiddha Ditya. And I'm Amit Doshi. And we host Shunya One. It's a really fun podcast where we talk to some of the best entrepreneurs in the country. Yes, talking about everything from their startup challenges to what they're building and all the future of technology right here. So catch us on the IVM Podcast website app or wherever you listen to your podcast from.